son was supposed to be a happy event for a tired child. For me, it was terrifying. While so many children might complain about being put to bed before they finished watching a film or playing their favorite video games, when I was a child, nighttime was something to truly feel. Somewhere in the back of my mind, it still is. As someone who is trained in the sciences, I cannot prove that what happened to me was objectively real, but I can swear that what I experienced was genuine horror. A fear which in my life, I'm glad to say, has never been equaled. I will relate it to you all now as best as I can. Make of it what you will, but I'll be glad to just get it off my chest. I can't remember exactly when it all started, but my apprehension towards falling asleep seemed to correspond with my being moved into a room of my own. I was eight years old at the time, and until then I had shared a room quite happily, in fact, with my older brother. As is perfectly understandable for a boy, five, for five years my senior, my brother, eventually wished for a room of his own. And as, a, and as a result, when I was given the room at the back of the house, it was a small, narrow, yet oddly elongated room, large enough for a bed and a couple of chest drawers, but not much else. I couldn't really complain, because even at that age, I understood that we did not have a large house, and I had no real cause to be disappointed. As my family was both loving and caring, it was a happy childhood. During the day, a solitary window looked out onto our back garden. Nothing out of the ordinary, but even during the daylight, which crept into that room, seemed almost hesitant. As my brother was given a new bed, I was given the bunk bags which we used to share. While I was upset about sleeping on my own, I was excited at the thought of being able to sleep in the top bunk, which seemed far more adventurous to me. From the very night, I remember a strange feeling of unease creeping slowly from the back of my mind. I lay on the top bunk, staring down at my action figures and cars, strewn across the green-blue carpet. As imaginary battles and adventures took place between the toys on the floor, I couldn't help but feel that my eyes were being slowly drawn towards the bottom bunk as if something was moving in the corner of my eye, something which did not wish to be seen. The bunk was empty, impeccably made with a dark blue blanket tucked in neatly, partially covering two rather bland white pillows. I didn't think anything of it at the time. I was a child, and the noise slipping under my door from my parents' television bathed me in a warm sense of safety and well-being. So, I fell asleep. When you awaken from a deep sleep, something moving or stirring, it can take a few moments for you to truly understand what is happening. The fog of sleep hangs over your eyes and ears even when lucid. Something was moving, there was no doubt about that. At first I wasn't sure what it was. Everything was dark, almost pitch black, but there was enough light creeping in from outside to outline that nearly suffocating room. Two thoughts appeared in my mind almost simultaneously. The first was that my parents were in bed because the rest of the house lay both in darkness and silence. The second thought turned to the noise, a noise which had obviously woken me. As the last cobwebs of sleep withered from my mind, the noise took on a more familiar form. Sometimes the simplest of sounds can be the most unnerving. A cold whistling through a tree outside. A neighbor's footsteps, uncomfortably close, or in this case, the simple sound of bed seats rustling in the dark. That was it. The bed seats rustling in the dark. As if some disturbed sleeper was attempting to get all too comfortable in the bottom back bunk. I lay there and desperately thinking that the noise was either my imagination 
or perhaps just my cat finding somewhere comfortable to spend the night. It was then that I noticed my door shut as it had been as I'd fallen asleep. Perhaps my mom had checked in on me and the cat had snuck in to the room then. Yes, that, that that's it. And then I turned to face my wall, closed my eyes in the vain hope that I could fall back to sleep. As I moved, the rustling noise from underneath me ceased. I thought that I must have disturbed my cat, but quickly I realized that the visitor in the bottom bunk was much less mundane than my pet trying to sleep. And much more sinister. As if alerted to and disgruntled by my presence, the disturbed sleeper began to toss and turn violently, like a child having a tantrum in the bed. I could hear the sheets twist and turn with increasing ferocity. Fear then gripped me like, not like the subtle sense of unease I had experienced earlier, but now potent, terrified. My heart raced as my eyes panicked, scanning the almost impenetrable, through darkness. I let out a cry, as most young boys do. I instinctively shouted, out, shouted for my mother. I could hear something stir on the other side of the house. But as I began to breathe a sigh of relief that my parents were coming to save me, the bunk bed suddenly started to shake violently as if gripped by an earthquake, scraping against the wall. I could hear the sheets below me thrashing around as if tormented by malice. I didn't want to jump down to safety as I feared the thing in the bottom bunk would reach out and grab me, pulling me into the darkness, so I stayed there, white knuckles clenching my own blanket like a shroud of protection. The wait seemed like an eternity. The door finally and thankfully burst open. I lay bathed in light while the bottom bunk, the resting place of my unwanted visitor, lay empty and peaceful. I cried and my mother consoled me, as mothers do. Tears of fear, followed by relief, streamed down my young face. Yet, through all of the horror and relief, I did not tell her why I was so upset. I I couldn't explain it. I couldn't explain it. But it was as though whatever had been in the bunk would return if I even so much as spoke of it or uttered a single syllable, syllable of its existence. Whether that was the truth, I, I, I don't, I do not know. But as a child, I felt as if that unseen menace remained close, listening. My mother lay in the empty bunk, promising to stay there until morning. Eventually my anxiety diminished, tiredness pushed me back towards sleep, but I remained restless, waking several times momentarily to the sound of rustling vengeance. I remember the next day I wanted to go anywhere, be anywhere, but in that narrow, suffocating room. It was a Saturday and I played outside, quite happily with my friends. Although our house was not large, we were lucky to have a long sloping garden in the back. We played there often. As much as it was overgrown, we could hide in the bushes, climb in the huge sycamore tree which towered above the entire, the entire freaking thing, and easily imagine ourselves in the throes of a grand adventure in some untamed exotic land. As fun as, as it all was, occasionally my eye would turn to that small window. Ordinary, slight, and innocuous. But for me, that thin boundary was a looking glass into a strange, cold pocket of dread. Outside the lush green surroundings of our garden, filled with the smiling faces of my friends, could not extinguish the creeping feeling clawing its way up my spine. Each hair standing on end. The feeling of something in that room watching me play. Waiting for the night when I would be alone, eagerly filled with hate. This may sound strange to you, but by the time my parents ushered me back into that room for the night, I said nothing. I didn't protest. I didn't even make an excuse as to why I couldn't sleep there. I simply and sullenly and sullenly walked into that room, climbed a few steps into the top bunk, and then waited. As an adult, I would be telling everyone about my experience, but even at that age, I felt almost silly to be talking about something 
which I didn't really have no evidence for. I'll be lying. However, that's this was my primary reason. I still felt that this thing would be enraged if I so much as spoke of it. It's funny how certain words can remain hidden from your mind, no matter how blatant or obvious they are. One word came to me that second night, lying there in the darkness alone. Fight. Aware of a rotten change in the atmosphere, thickening of the air as if something had displaced it. As I heard the first casual twist of the bed sheets below, the first anxious increase in my heartbeat, I had the realization that something was once again in the bottom bunk. That word, a word which had been sent to exile, filtered up through my consciousness, breaking free of all repression, gasping for air, screaming, etching, and carving itself into my mind. Ghost. As this thought came to me, I knew that my unwelcome visitor had ceased moving. The bed sheets lay calm and dark, but they had been replaced by something far more peace. A slow, rhythmic, rasping breath heaved and escaped from the thing below. I can imagine its chest rising and falling with each sordid wheezing and garbled breath. I shuddered and hoped beyond hope, not all hope that it would leave without occurrence. The house lay as it had the previous night, in a thick blanket of darkness. Silence prevailed, all but for the perverted breath of air. All but for the per perverted breath of my as yet unseen bunkmate. I lay there terrified. I just wanted this thing to go, to leave me alone. What did it want? Then something unmistakably chilling transpired. It moved. It moved in a way different from before. When it threw itself around in the bottom of the bunk, it seemed unrestrained, without purpose, almost animalistic. This movement, however, was driven by awareness for purpose, with a goal in mind. For that thing lying there in the darkness, that thing which seemed intent on terrorizing a young boy, calmly and nonchalantly, sat up. Its labored breathing had become louder, as now only a mattress and a few flimsy wood slats separated my body from the unearthly breath below. I lay there, my eyes filled with tears, a fear which mere words cannot relate to you or anyone else to course through my veins. I would not have believed that this fear could have been heightened. I was wrong. So, I imagine what this thing would look like sitting there listening, listening from below my mat hoping to catch the slightest hint that I was awake. Imagination then turned to an unnerving reality. It began to touch the wooden slits, which my mattress sat on. It seemed to caress them carefully, running what I imagined to be fingers and hands across the surface of the wood. Then with great force it prodded angrily two slits into the mattress, even though the padding, it felt as if Though someone had viciously stuck their fingers into my side, I let out an almighty cry and the reason shaking and moving thing the bunk below replied in kind by violently vibrating the bunk as it had done the night before. Small flakes of paint powdered onto my blanket from the walls to frame bed frame, scraping along the wall backwards and forwards. Once again I was bathed in light and there stood my mother, loving, caring, as she always was. With a comforting hug and calming words which eventually subdued my hysteria. Of course she asked what was wrong, but I couldn't say. I, I, I dared not to. I simply said one word over and over again. Nightmare. This pattern of events continued for weeks, if not months. Night after night I would awaken to the sound of rustling sheets, each time I would scream so as to not provide the summons with time to prod and feel for me. With each cry, the bed would shake violently, stopping with the rival of my mother who would spend the rest of the night in the bottom bunk. 
seemingly unaware of the sinister force torturing her son nightly. Along the way, I managed to feign illness a few times and come up with other less than truthful reasons for sleeping in my parents' bed. But more often than not, I would be alone for the first few hours of each night in that place. The room where the light from the outside did not sit right, alone with that thing. With time, you can become desensitized to almost anything, no matter how horrific. I had come to realize that, that for whatever reason, this thing could not harm me when my mother was present. I'm sure the same would have been said for my father, but as loving as he was, waking him from sleep was almost impossible. After a few months, I had grown accustomed to my nightly visitor. Do not mistake this for some unearthly French. Okay? I detested this thing. I still feared it greatly. As I could almost sense its desire and its personality, as if you could call it that. One filled with a perverted and twisted hatred. Yet longing for me. Of perhaps all things. My greatest fears were realized in the winter. The days grew short and the longer nights merely provided this wretch with more opportunities. It was a difficult time for my family. My grandmother, a wonderfully kind and gentle woman, had deteriorated greatly since the death of my grandfather. My mother was trying her best to keep her in the community as long as possible. However, dementia is a cruel and degenerative illness, robbing a person of their memories one day at a time. Soon she recognized none of us, and it became clear that she would need to be moved from her house to a nursing home. Before she could be moved, my grandmother had a particularly difficult few nights, and my mother decided that she would stay with her. As much as I loved my grandfather and felt nothing but anguish at her illness, to this day I feel guilty that my first thoughts were not of her, but of what my nightly visitor may do should it become aware of my mother's absence. Her presence being the one thing which I was sure was protecting me from the full horror of this thing's reach. I rushed home from school that day and immediately rented the bed sheets and mattress from the lower bunk, moving all the slats and placing, uh, and placing them on an old desk, a chest of drawers and some chairs which we kept in a cupboard where the bomb bunk used to be. I told my father I was making an office, which he found adorable, but I would be damned if I give that thing a place to sleep for one more night. As darkness approached, I lay there knowing my mother was not in the house. I did not know what to do. My only impulse was to sneak into her jewelry box and take a small family crucifix, which I had seen there before. While my family was not very religious, at that age I still believed in God and hope that somehow this would protect me. Although fearful and anxious, while gripping the cru crucifix under my pillow tightly in one hand, sleep eventually came and as I drifted off to dream, I hoped that I would awaken in the morning without incidents. Unfortunately, that night was the most terrifying of all. I will graduate. The room was once again dark, as my eyes adjusted, I could gradually make out the window and the door and the walls, some toys on a shelf, and even to this day, I shudder to think of it. Well, there was no knock, no noise, no rustling of sheets, no movement at all. The room felt lifeless. Lifeless, yet not empty. The nightly visitor that un- welcome, wheezing, hate-built thing which had terrorized me night after night was not in the bottom of it. It was in my bed. I opened my mouth to scream but nothing came out. Utter terror had shaken the very sound of my voice. I lay motionless. But I could not scream I did not want to let it know I was awake. I had not yet seen it, I could only feel it. It was obscured under my blanket. I could see its outline, and I could feel its presence, but I dared not look. The weight of it pressed down on top of me, a sensation I will never forget. When I say that hours passed, I do not exaggerate. 
laying there motionless in the darkness. I was every bit as scared and frightened as a young boy could and would and should be. If it had been during the summer months, it would have been light by then, but the grasp of winter is long and, and unrelenting. I knew it would be hours before sunrise, a sunrise which I yearned for. I was a timid child by nature, but I reached a breaking point, a moment where I could wait no more, where I could survive under this intimately deviant abomination no longer. Fear can sometimes wear you out, make you threadbare, a shell of nerves leaving only the slightest trace of you behind. I had to get out of that bed. Then I remembered the crucifix. My hand still lay underneath the pillow, but it was empty. I slowly moved my wrist around to find it, minimizing as best I could the sound of the caused by, but it could not be found. I had either knocked it off the top ring, or it had. I could not even bear to think of it. Been being taken from my hand. Without the crucifix, I lost any sense of hope. Even at such a young age, you can be acutely aware of what death is, and intensely frightened of it. I knew I was going to die in that bed if I lay there, dormant, passive, doing nothing. I had to leave that room behind. But how? Should I leap from the bed and hope that I make it to the door? What if it is faster than me? Or should I slowly slip out of that top bag, hoping to not disturb my uncanny bedfellow? Really that it had not stirred when I moved, trying to find the crucifix, I began to have the strangest thoughts. What if it was asleep? I hadn't so much as breathed since I had woken up. Perhaps it was resting, believing it had finally got me. That I was finally in its grasp. Or, pa or perhaps it was torn with me. After all, it had been doing just that for countless nights, and now with me under it, pinned against my mattress with no mother to protect me, maybe it was holding off, savoring its victory, until the last possible moment, like a wild animal, savoring its prey. I tried to breathe as shallowly as possible, but mustering every ounce of courage I could, I reached over slowly with my right hand began to peel the blanket off of me. What I found under those covers almost stopped my heart. I did not see it, but as my hand moved the blanket, it brushed against something, something smooth and cold, something which felt unmistakably like a gaunt hand. I held my breath in terror as I was sure it must now have known that I was awake. Nothing. It did not stir. It felt dead. After a few moments, I placed my hand carefully further down the blanket and felt a thin, poorly formed forearm. My confidence and almost twisted sense of growing grew as I moved down further to a disproportionately large bicep muscle. The arm was outstretched lying across my throat, lying across my chest, with the hand resting on my left shoulder, as if it had grabbed me in my sleep. I realized that I would have to move this cadaver's appendage if I even so much as hoped to escape its grasp. For some reason, the feeling of torn, ragged clothing on the shoulder of this nighttime invader stopped me in my tracks. Fear once again swelled in my stomach and my chest as I reached for my hand and discussed the touch of its straggled, oily hair. I cannot bring myself to touch its face, although I wonder this, to this day what it would have felt like. Dear God, it moved. It moved. It was subtle, but its grip on my shoulder and across my body strengthened. No tears, tears came, but God, how I wanted to cry. As its hand and arm slowly coiled around me, my right leg brushed along the cool wall which the bed lay against. Of all that happened to me in that room, this was the strangest. I realized that this clutching, rancid thing which drew great delight from violating a young boy's bed was not entirely on top of me. It was sticking out from the wall, like a spider, striking from its lair. Suddenly, its grip moved from a slow tightening to a sudden squeeze. It pulled and clawed at my clothes as if frightened that the opportunity would soon pass. 
I fought against it, but it's emaciated arm was too strong for me. Its head rose up, writhing and contorting on it like it. I now realized where it was taking me. Into the wall. I fought for dear life. I cried, and suddenly my voice returned again to me, screaming, yelling. But no one came. Then I realized why I was so eagerly to suddenly strike, and why this thing had to happen now. Through my window, that window which seemed to be represent so much malice around outside, streaked hope, the first rays of sunshine. I struggled further, knowing that if I could just hold on, it would soon go away. As I fought for my life, the unearthly parasite shifted, slowly pulling itself up my chest, its head now poking out from under the blanket, wheezing, coughing, rasping. I don't remember features, I simply remember its breath against my face, foul and as cold as ice. As the sun broke over the horizon, that dark place that subhuman room of the temples washed, bathed in sunlight. I passed out as its scrawny fingers encircled my neck, squeezing the very life from me. I awoke to my father offering to make me some breakfast. A wonderful sight indeed. I survived the most horrible experience of my life until then and now. I moved the bed away from the wall, leaving behind the furniture I had believed would stop that thing from taking my bed. Little did I think that it would try to take mine and me. Weeks passed without incidents, yet on one cold, frostbitten night, I woke to the sound of furniture where the bunk beds used to be vibrating violently. In a moment it passed. I lay there, sure I could hear a distant wheezing coming from deep within a wall, finally fading into the distance. I've never told anyone this story before. To this day, I still break out in a cold sweat at the sound of bed sheets rustling in the night, or a breeze brought on by a common cold. And I certainly never sleep in my bed against a wall anymore. Call it superstition if you will, but as I said, I cannot con discount conventional explanations such as sleep paralysis, hallucination, or that an overactive imagination. But what can I say? What I can say is this: the following year, I was given a larger room on the other side of the house. My parents took the strangely subcanny room as their bedroom. They said they didn't need a large room, just one big enough for a bed and a few things. They lasted ten, ten days. We moved on the eleventh.